Well, I was supposed to start chapter two yesterday, I mean Wednesday, and obviously I didn't. And I'm thinking, what did I do? I said, see, here's the problem. I do all this collateral reading to go along with this class, because this book I bought on social psychology is really cool. And then it prompts me to want to talk about stuff in here and slows me down a little bit. But anything I read that has to do with the cha chapter two, I just didn't care much for biology class when I took it, so we'll get through chapter two real fast. Uh, I, I want to finish up one more thing from chapter one. It's on page 30 where it talks about research methods. Do all of you like these research methods that uh, psychologists use? Naturalistic observation. What is that all about? That's just sitting around observing people and making notes on what you see and then probably saying to somebody else, did you notice? Did you notice? Like someone said to me one time, you know, we sit in class and observe you when you teach us to do this stuff, and we notice that you use your hands a lot when you talk. Have you noticed that? Say, no, I didn't notice. Well, now you will since I mentioned it, and, but some of you noticed. So I, said, so I said, well, you know, I can fix that. I'll just put, put my hands in my pockets when I give my lectures, and then they won't be wave, waving around. So what do I start doing when I'm not using my hands? D did you notice? I said, I don't have a stutter. I say, well, you do if you put your hands in your pockets because it throws you off track. So you just observe things and, and then sometimes try something, like that was an experiment. That would be one of these experiments over here the, the fourth method that they mentioned. No, the fifth myth. One, two, three, four. The, the fifth method would be doing an experiment. I'll put my hands in my pockets and see what happens. And that's an experiment. And then I find out that I hesitate when I'm talking. So I think, pull your hands out of your pockets and go back to being normal. And just realize you wave your hands a lot when you talk. So naturalistic observation. Now again, we're back in the book of Proverbs. Do you think people, when they heard those Proverbs back there, uh, looked around to see if anybody was doing the stuff they were talking about? I mean, isn't that just part of our nature to observe things? Oh, do any of you work with little children who ask a lot of questions? Okay, why are these little children asking all these questions? Because they're observing things and they're curious about the world? And so when they're practicing this scientific method of observation and then asking questions when they think about it, it looks to me like they're just doing, they're just doing what God created them to do, to observe. So what do we adults say to these little children when they keep asking questions? Don't ask so many questions. Don't be the person God created you to be. And don't be scientific. Just sit there like a sponge and soak up what's going on around you. I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Somebody's missed something here. Then I thought, so then, I, so then see, I asked a question. So why would an adult say that to a young child who's wanting to learn so much and who's doing all this naturalistic stuff about observing and asking questions and wanting to learn? Why would we tell a child to quit asking so many questions? Why, why would someone do that? They get annoyed. It's annoying. Mm -hmm. Why would that annoy you that a little kid keeps asking questions? Because half the ones are the same questions. What? Half the questions are the same questions. Over and over and over again. But what do you think they're trying to do when they keep asking those same questions over and over and over again? Okay. Trying to get that stuff sorted out in their head? What's the best thing we could do to a little kid who's asking us questions? Answer them. Answer them. And then when you answer one question, what does he do? Ask another one. Yeah, he asks another one. Then when you answer that one, what does she do? She asks another one. You say, you start answering her questions, and they're going to ask more of them. I'm saying, so what's wrong with that? It's like, I just don't want to be bothered. It just annoys me. 
I would rather be left alone. <clears throat> but why don't we just put you in a room someplace by yourself so you don't have any little children around you? <clears throat> in fact, sometimes I've wondered, I've asked the question, why do parents have children if they don't want them asking all these questions? They ought to figure this out before they get married. If you don't want little kids asking you questions, don't have little kids. Let someone who wants to help them grow and develop bring them into the world and ask them questions. And I think it's sad that just looking around you say, there's a lot of people that just don't want to do what they need to do to help little children grow because they're just not tuned into what's going on. They haven't taken this class where they can learn that, hey, that's what you want to do. And by the way, sometimes I get tired of little kids asking me questions. But I don't want to stop their curiosity or stop their inquiry or stop their practicing the scientific method. So I tried something one time. I'm into doing experiments. Since they're asking so many questions, why don't I turn around and ask them some questions. Have you ever done that? Some little kid asking you a question and you turn around and you answer his question saying, now let me ask you a question. And then he, he sits there and thinks about it or she thinks about it and, and then you go, aha, a little piece of quiet for a while while they're thinking about this. But at the same time, when you start asking them questions, then you can see the wheels turning and see them thinking about it. And it, it can be a very pleasant kind of experience. Okay. So that's just an observation. Just, so just look at what's going on around you. Just go someplace and sit and watch people. Put your plate in the corner of the cafeteria and just take a little notebook and sit there and take notes on what you observe. Before class started, I yawned and I heard somebody else yawn. And then I said, isn't that interesting how yawning is contagious? So is laughter. I mean. I don't know if you, you ever have been in space, but someone says something at a table in the cafeteria and everybody's laughing, and pretty soon people at the table next to them start laughing and they didn't hear what was said. They're just laughing because laughter is contagious. I could make all of you start laughing. All I'd have to do is just start laughing. For no reason, I'll just start laughing. And if I did it long enough, see, now, some of you are already giggling a little bit just thinking about it. If I, if I started laughing and did it long enough, all of you would eventually start laughing. I know a lot of you would say, this guy is just weird. Well, it's because I'm practicing this, these scientific methods. I'm observing, and then what am I doing? I'm taking cases and studying them, little kids. Uh, I had two daughters, studied them all my life. And did some experiments with them. And sometimes you take surveys. Along with studying like a case is one or two individuals. And of course, uh, how many how many siblings do you have? Two, 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 four, 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 three, three, four. Whoa, those people with four siblings. That's enough to wear you out, isn't it? Now, and, okay, so those of you who have four siblings, did your parents, after they raised the first one, say, ah, now I know how to raise children? No. Because the second one was what? Have, have, what have you heard your parents say? The second one was... Trouble. Different than the first. So now I've raised two that are different. Now the third, I'll know how to handle that one. What happens? I mean, if, if you go steal something and you leave your fingerprints on the counter, can't they take your fingerprints and find you and determine that it was you? If we have a unique set of fingerprints, what do you think? What would you infer from that? That God made each of us unique enough to where it doesn't matter if you have 10 children, raising the 10th one is gonna be a different experience than raising the first one or the second one or the third one. And you just understand that. So you're working with little children someplace in a room. And, and to me, that's part of the fun of working with little kids is observing and learning things about each of their little personalities. So a case study would be just where you're studying one or two people <coughs> or a family or something like that. And then a survey is where <coughs> you just ask a question. 
for example, before class started, we, we talked about yawning was contagious and laughter is contagious. Now, you could take a survey on campus. You could just walk around and say, so which is more contagious, yawning or laughter? And you know what a lot of people will say? I don't know. Why are you asking that? And what you say is, I'm being a psychologist doing scientific study. I'm taking a survey to see what people think. And somebody says, I don't think either one's contagious. And you put neither, put a check mark under there. I think they're equally contagious. Put a check, you, you follow what happens, you do a survey, you collect information, you see what people say. Then, <coughs> if, you, if you want to, <coughs> you look to see if, oh, this correlational thing, isn't this interesting? All the women we surveyed seem to have very similar answers and all the men we surveyed had very similar answers but their answers were different. So it looks like certain kinds of answers correlate with the female half of our survey group <coughs> and other kinds of answers <coughs> Excuse me. Correlate with the male half of our survey group, and so that's what. So correlation just simply means I'm looking for a relationship. How many of you got a high school diploma? And here you are in college. Is there a correlation between a high school diploma and going to college? Do you know anybody who didn't get a high school diploma? who just quit school because they got to their senior year and they got tired of it and didn't want to mess with it or fell in love <laughs> and got married and dropped out of school. Do any of you know people like that? Yeah. Now, have they lived long enough to tell you how they feel about that? See, I have a, uh, some friends I know where that happened and to this day what do you think is the one thing she insisted that all of her children do Finish high school. graduate from high school because she left high school with only one semester of work to do and that kept her from getting into college to, to do what she loves to do and she needed a college degree to do it and so she insisted, my children are going to get a high school diploma. Oh, that's a nice thing to observe, is to watch how people raise their children based on their own life experiences. So correlation is just looking for relationships between things. The one thing to remember, and you, I have to keep reminding people of this, when you find a correlation, it does not necessarily mean one of those caused the other. Correlation is not causation, it's just that there's a relationship between the two. You can make a prediction. I, I think the book, doesn't it talk about guys flying airplanes and what kind of tests could you give to correlate highly with uh, successful pilots and then say let's give those tests up front because it costs a lot of money for the military to train the pilot so let's give those tests up front and let's see if they score high enough on these instruments that we could predict that they would be a good pilot. But scoring high doesn't cause you to be a good pilot, it just correlates with it. Because they took a lot of good pilots and gave them a test and noticed that all of them had certain, certain characteristics from the test, they all seem to give certain answers. So we're looking for people who give those kinds of answers thinking that they'll make good pilots. And maybe they will, maybe they won't. They're not looking at causation, they're looking at correlation. And what the military is trying to do is to simply save money on not, don't send people to pilot school who aren't going to pan out to be good pilots. And then experimental stuff. Now, I think you have a whole section in your book. T today, uh, people don't do it. Okay, I guess I should tell you a story about years by. In, in years past, a guy actually wrote a textbook on uh, 
behaviorism. And he didn't mess around. He ran a summer camp for little kids, and he would bring these little kids to camp, and he would mess with them using behavioristic principles and put them into groups and then have them get mad at each other and then have them make friends with each other. And he was messing with these little kids as subjects to prove his theory. And a whole bunch of people got real upset about that and said, you don't go around messing with children. I mean, can't you see? Here's a parent says, I'll do an experiment. I'll be real strict with one child and then be real permissive with the other to see how they turn out. What? You're talking about somebody's future here? You don't want to mess with that. So, basically, a scientist, he can mix sodium and chloride together and see what he gets. And what does he get? Sodium and chlorine. He gets sodium chloride. What is that? You say, this is not chemistry class. Why are you asking questions about that? You didn't study that anywhere? Table salt. You get that stuff we put on food to make it taste better. And so it's like, well, can I do that? Can I just mix people together? Now, sometimes I do some experiments with people. I read something one time in a book when I was in graduate school in a psychology class about how what you say influences other people. I'm going, come on. What you say doesn't have that big of influence on somebody. I mean, I didn't agree with the book. So I thought, I'll take what the book says and test it. So I'd come home from class and I'd walk down and I said, Nina, what is that smell? What are you cooking for supper? It smells like roadkill. Yeah, any idea what happened? <laughs> Did I get in trouble? Then the next day I'd come home from class and I'd say, Whoa, something smells delicious. I can't wait to eat supper. Did I change the whole flavor of the whole evening depending on what I said when I walked in the house about what was going on in the kitchen? Now see, a bunch of girls in there going, Yes, yes, yes. And all I can say is, you girls are way too sensitive about this stuff. All I'm doing is a little experiment just to see if what people say about you is true. Well, shame on you. You should have been smart enough to figure that out without doing your experiment. <laughs> and I agree. Shame on me. But there are some experiments that I think are worth doing. Like in... Proverbs, whoa, don't lose that. I've actually had young people do some of these. In Proverbs 3, 1 and 2, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. How, how does a heart keep commandments? Like I'm sitting here thinking, how does my heart keep a commandment? Do I know any commandments? Yeah. Can you repeat any commandments you know? I can. Thou shalt not steal. One of the Ten Commandments. I was taught that before I became a Christian. Any idea what happens when you memorize that commandment and you keep it in your heart and someone says, let's go steal some gas so we don't have to buy it to put in our car? Even when I wasn't a Christian, I would get a knot in my stomach and say, I don't think so, guys. I have a job. I earn some money. I can afford to buy gas. Well, we can't. Well, then I'm going on to town, and you guys go try not to get arrested. But even before I got saved, it's just like, if I have a commandment from God hidden in my heart, it's going to affect my life. And look what it says in verse 2 of Proverbs 3. For length of days and years of life, now you won't know that till you've lived a long time, but here's the part you can experiment with, and peace they will add to you. So I'm driving to town with money to buy gas while my friends are out trying to steal it. Who's more at peace with themselves and with life in general? You know anybody who steals stuff? 
when they're stealing, they're just as nervous as they can be. Oh, by the way, if you happen to have a friend who steals stuff a lot, this is so. This to me is so amazing. If you have a friend who steals stuff a lot, and you go to his house and visit him, spend some time with him, and he can't find something, what's the first thing he thinks? When he stole it. Not only somebody stole. He says, "Tom, did you steal my whatever?" It's like, "Why? I don't steal. What are you saying?" Well, somebody stole it. And why does he think people steal stuff from him? Because that's what he does. This stealing becomes like a, a, a rottenness in the fiber of his character. So you can take some of this stuff and say, sure enough, if I take a promise, a commandment from God, and I put it in my heart, and I memorize it, and I meditate on it, and I think about it, it's going to add peace to my life. I think I have another one in here, too. Oh, Proverbs 3, since we're in 3, 5 and 6. I've got that one memorized. Do you? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. And what would be the outcome? And He'll direct your path. That's cool stuff. Let's see, where was the next one? Proverbs 12. I mean, i got a bunch up here, but Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. Have you ever been anxious about anything? Does it kind of feel like a weight on your shoulders? Ah, see how what we're doing, we're reading a proverb, we're observing in our own lives and other people's lives, but good words make, uh, but a good word makes him glad. When somebody's anxious about something and you come along with a good word, it makes them glad. And you can do something about that. And you could what have some, you could have some friends of yours, if you see someone who's anxious, uh, walk up to them and give them a good word and see if it doesn't lighten their load a little bit. And by the way, since we're talking about this anxious stuff here, uh, we're going to talk about it some more in the next chapter. But I have a little handout for you here. Does anyone know Philippians 4, 6, and 7? Does anyone have, a, have those verses memorized? If you don't, do you have your Bible on your little computer where you could look it up? Say, so, yeah, I'm not going to look it Okay. If somebody finds it, go ahead and read it. And if you don't, then I'll try to find it when I get back up front. I gave you what? Philippians 4, what? Philippians 4, 6 and 7. You want to read it? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, now, based on that passage of Scripture, I made up these little papers. You don't turn these back in. You keep this. The first thing you do is something that makes me anxious is, and I write it down. Each day for one week, I will read or recite Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And because the passage talks about being thankful, and I will thank God for... And I just wrote down something I could thank God for. And then I will ask God to... And I put down what I'm going to ask God for. And then, let's see, today is Friday. So I'll say, did you do that today? I say, well, it's, I'll put a mark by Friday. I said, I'm going to do it after this class is over. 
And to remember, I'm going to fold it over and put it in my pocket and carry it with me. And then I circle yes if I do it before midnight on Friday. And then I pull this little paper out tomorrow and I circle a yes again if I go through this little routine tomorrow. And then I do that every day for a week. And then that means when we come to class next Wednesday, I'm, I'm not going to ask for your sheets to be turned in, but I'm going to say, well, talk to me about what happened when you took something that made you anxious and spent some time thanking God for something and then asking God to do something about it. And you can look, how many, how many yeses do you have? Does anyone know what will happen when we have that conversation next Wednesday? Anyone want to predict what will happen? Hypothesize? Theorize about what will happen next Wednesday when we meet together and talk about this? Okay. Then we won't talk about it. We'll just wait and do that when we come back to class <clears throat> on Wednesday of next week. Because we don't have class on Monday, right? So on Wednesday when we come back, I'll try to make a note that that's the first thing I'll ask you. And we'll see how this little experiment goes. Now, <clears throat> in terms of psychological terms, I'm calling this an experiment. But really, you know what this is? This is simply applying the Word of God to my life. Where people talk about you study the Bible and you learn what it says. And then you apply it to your life. When my two daughters were little girls... One of them was trying to memorize her Bible verses because we were enrolled in a Bible memory program. <coughs> and her sister was banging on her door while she was in her room trying to memorize her verses. And she goes, Sister, leave me alone. I'm trying to memorize my verses. And, and her sister, <coughs> anybody have a little sister? And her little sister, that just made her bug her a little more. Oh, you're the little sister that did the bug into the big sister. And so then it's like she said, leave me alone. And then she goes, Dad, she's bothering me. And I said, well, what are you doing? She said, I'm memorizing my verses. I said, so what are the verses you're memorizing? Be ye kind one to another. Well, there you go. She said, what? I said, there you go. What are you memorizing? Be ye kind one to another. I said, be what? And she goes, what do you mean be what, Dad? I said, what is that verse telling you to be? She says, uh, oh, it's telling me to be kind. Oh, all of a sudden, she quit memorizing and started thinking about it. And I said, uh, does it say be kind to your sister or just be kind to other people? And she didn't answer my question. She said, but Dad, I'm trying to memorize my verses. Now, anytime you read a Bible verse and then you say, but I'm da-da-da-da-da, you know what you just did? You just turned a corner and tried to think of a reason for not applying the Word of God to your life. And I have a picture in my mind of people who do that. You're driving down the road, you hear a Bible verse on the radio, you ignore it, and the next thing you know, your car's in the ditch. The quickest way to run into the ditch is just ignore what God says about how we're supposed to live. The best way to stay on that straight and narrow path that God wants us all to walk is to simply hide the Word of God in our heart and put it to practice in our lives. Okay. Yeah, we're finished with chapter 1. It's a good thing because we have to cover chapter 2 here. So let's move on <clears throat> to chapter 2. Chapter 2, the biological basis of behavior. Page 47. First, this is a out in the middle of the page. First, the human brain is an extremely <clears throat> complex organ. Does everyone see that? 
right in the middle of page 47. First, the human brain is an extremely complex organ. Is that what your book says? Yeah. Did I leave something out? Yeah. What did I leave out? The product of millions of years of evolution. Well, he put it in between little lines. You know what that's, those little lines are there for? To point out the error of his way. <laughs> I mean, that's a, it's like, okay, the, the human brain is an extremely complex organ. If it's as complex as they say it is, the mathematical probability of it becoming what it is today by evolution, guess what the mathematics of that is? It's mathematically impossible. I have a friend who's a science teacher, and when he got his uh, master's degree in science at the University of Nebraska, his professor, he, he liked his professor. He was a nice guy, and he was learning a lot from him. But every time they, he started talking about evolution, it was like, it's, it's almost like, do you see how that phrase, it, it's almost like it doesn't fit with it being an extre extremely complex organ. And so my friend went to his instructor and he said, after class he said, I'm just curious, why do you believe in evolution? And this guy with a PhD in science looked at him and said, if I didn't believe in evolution, I would have to believe in God. And I refuse to believe in God. Therefore, this is my only alternative. What do we call people like that in Oklahoma? Summer and stumps. Now, he's smarter than I am intellectually, and he knows more about science and the brain and the body and all this stuff, but he's just dumber than a stump. I mean, you can go on the internet <laughs> and find, there's a cool place on the internet, 44 reasons why evolution can't be true. It's, it's marvelous reading, marvelous reading. So what happens here? See, understand, you're just going to, you're going to get this thrown at you because we live in a world where... Uh, what is, it, what is it we said at the first of this book? Everybody agrees. Psychology didn't exist until the late 1800s. Well, maybe everybody else agrees, but we know better than that, don't we? We can trace back what the science of psychology and say people have been doing that for years. Observing, doing case studies. Why is this family like this? And people sit around and talk about it and try to find out and all that stuff and experiments even we've done things so it's like same thing here okay so basically everybody agrees evolution is the popular accepted response for how did we get here I have a friend a Christian friend who went to a secular university and every time I see him he says so Tom well, back when I was going to school, he said, he, he, we got together one summer and he said, so Tom, now that you've finished your PhD, do you still believe that God created the world and all that's in it in seven days? And I said, well, if you're asking, did I hear a lot of people tell me that that's not the way it happened? Uh, I would say, yeah, I heard a lot of that. If you're asking me if I swallowed it, the answer is no, I didn't take the poison, I didn't drink the Kool-Aid, because uh, the Bible is just so powerful that if I read something in a book and I read something in the Bible and they contradict each other, I'm going with the Bible every time. He said, that is so ridiculous, I don't see how you could do that. And I said, you know what, God could have spared us this discussion 
and we wouldn't have these disagreements if he had just left the first part of Genesis out of the Bible and just picked up with where there was a flood or something and didn't tell us how it all started. Then it would be up for grabs to just second guess as to how it all got started. But he did tell us. Now did he tell us that just so you and I could argue every time we get together? Or did he tell us that because he wanted those of us who are followers of him, who believe what he says, to not get carried away with all the extreme thinking of the day? And, and by the way, my collateral reading for this class, I told you, is on the chapter Social Psychology. And this guy in this book says, you know what's wrong with social Darwinism? You know what's wrong with so social evolution? Okay, does anyone know anything about uh, the evolutionary theory, Darwinian theory of evolution? The survival of what? Of the fittest. If we practice the survival of the fittest socially, <laughs> what does that mean? If we're taking an exit and I'm driving a bigger truck than you are, guess what? It's okay for me to run you off the road because I'm more fit to be here than you are. The other night, coming back from taking my grandson home from school, a big old truck was right on my bumper coming down 58 Highway from Lone Jack back to Greenwood. I mean, he was right on my bumper. If a deer would have jumped out and I would have hit my brakes, he would have run into me because his reaction time would be such that he would have hit me before he could get his foot to the brake because he was, I mean, he was right there. He was like this far from my back bumper. And I, I thought about just hitting my, tapping my brakes just to, just to mess with him a little bit. But then I thought, no, there's too much road rage out there. He might just pull his big truck over and get his big gun out and start shooting at me. So I'm thinking, better just keep driving and just let him ride your bumper. Just try not to make him run over you so you don't have a wreck because I'm going out of town this weekend. Got things to do. But this guy who wrote this book I'm reading on social psychology, and it's a textbook for colleges and universities, he sees from a social standpoint, do you see the danger of social evolution? It doesn't matter how you treat people as long as you're bigger and stronger. And that's just not the way that, that makes for a healthy society. And, and so biology talks about this and it's like, well, mathematically for this, and even and even when you come to biology books, did, do any of you remember studying the eye and how complex it is? Even evolutionists will tell you that when you study the eye and the complexities involved in that, it's hard to say that that evolved. And I'm thinking, well, if it's so hard to say, then why don't you just discover the truth? But I learned something in grad school at the university that I thought was very interesting. I met all these people who, had, who knew all this stuff and who were smarter than I'll ever be, but they hadn't read the Bible. They didn't know what the Bible said about stuff. In fact, one lady in the class, she said we were talking about, oh, she was complaining about some teacher at her school putting a, a Bible on her desk so while she ate lunch, she read it. I said, what's wrong with that? It's no different than somebody else putting a novel on their desk to read. She goes, well, she shouldn't be reading the Bible and being a teacher. I'm going, why not? I mean, give her a little attitude. I mean, is the Bible going to hurt her? I don't think so. And then she goes, well, do you read the Bible? And I said, yes, I do. She said, are you a Christian? And I said, yes, I am. This was before class started. And then she looked at me and she said, well, then how did you get into graduate school? What's the assumption? If you read the Bible and if you're a Christian, you're not smart enough to get into graduate school. There are no questions on the graduate record exam that have to do with Christianity or the Bible. They all have to do with math, 
half of it's math and half of it's English. Well, I knew how I would do on the math part. I've got a major in mathematics. The English part, I just studied for that. So I made a huge score on the graduate record exam. Thank you, Lord. Because in class, all of my professors, they would say, Tom, it's interesting that you Christians come here and study. Why do you study here? I said, because I learn a lot from you guys, and I'm glad to spend the money to learn it. And he said, well, he said, what puzzles me is that you're a Christian, but you had this kind of GRE score. And it's like, see, it's like, what are they thinking? There's no way a Christian could score that high. And I'm, and I, and I almost wanted to say, they don't ask any Christian questions on the test. It's all math and language skills. But I thought, no, just let him wallow around in his ignorance and try to figure it out. But you understand what I did for me as a Christian to realize that I had a whole, a whole bunch of truth that they never read. And one time, one guy said to me, he said, Tommy said, this kind of puzzles me. He said, you read the Bible, and he said, I know you don't agree with everything we say. How does that work out? I said, it works out quite well, because whenever you say something that contradicts the Bible, and then I reject it because it contradicts the Bible, and I do what the Bible says, after you guys practice it, try it for a while, you find out it's not a very good idea either, and so you change your mind. I just get a head start on you by reading the Bible first. You, you follow that thinking? I just don't mess around with doing things the wrong way when the Bible says this is the way to do it. Now where the Bible doesn't address it, then it's up for grabs. But where the Bible says something, don't let the rest of the world mess you up. And just realize that, and you know sometimes we Christians get just, oh, no, it's just not fair. They don't treat us Christians right. You know, it's, it's like they're, they're objective about everybody but us. Well, okay, who are God's chosen people? God chose a nation years ago, right? Who are they? Israel. Israel. And what's the common name that people use to talk about Israel? Jews? Sounds a little derogatory to me. And people like to give them grief. If God's chosen people have been catching grief from the beginning of time, what makes us think we're going to be exempt? If Rome was using Christians for torches, dipped in tar, of course, but what makes you think we're going to be exempt? But, like Daniel, and what? You just be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, and live out the life that God's called you to live. And it did help that I have a sense of humor over there, so I didn't get all worked up about this stuff. And when they'd get worked up about it, my advisor would tell them they ought to lighten up a little bit. Okay, so first, the human brain is, a, is an extremely complex organ. I even have trouble saying it's a product of millions of years of evolution. But that's what the book says. But just since that's in there and those little marks, just ignore it. Second, the human brain demonstrates extraordinary plasticity. What, what do you think that means? The human brain is kind of, what, like, okay, if someone's in an accident and their brain is injured, what can happen? And, and they can't talk, they can learn to talk again. The, the, that's an extreme case that shows you that the brain has all kinds of this capacity to recover. I hope we understand what that, the implications of that is that somebody who's been messed up in life big time, God can put their mind straight and get them back on the right path. Nobody's so far gone that God can't fix their lives. And that's important for us to keep that in mind. Page 59, I like this phrase on page 59, the human brain is our crowning glory. It almost sounds like he's reading from the Bible, does it? It's the product, oh there it is again, the product of millions of years of evolution. <laughs> he just can't keep from saying that. 
And by the way, look at the psychology of this. If if you hear a lie long enough, what will you start to do after a while? You'll start to believe it. So be careful of the lies that are thrown at us every day and say, don't let them uh, affect the way I think. Help me to keep my mind stayed upon the Word of God. Now, one way to understand the human brain, it says on page 59, is to look at three layers that evolved in different stages of evolution. The central core, the limbic system, and the cerebral hemisphere. Now see, those three all work together, don't they? Like a, a smoothly oiled machine. And what does he say? They evolved in different stages of evolution? No. What's the biblical answer to that? To looking at these three facets biologically of the human brain. The central core, the limbic system, and the cerebral hemisphere. And I have a handout for you here for the people online. You've got this. You can find this under files. And the reason I'm giving you this is this whole thing on the brain, and there's lots of brain research going on today, but I think it's healthy to have this in a file in case you don't keep your book. This someday you can say this is what my brain is doing. The central core. Now, see, there are all those Latin names again. But on the right, it tells you what it does. I just walked back there and handed this stuff out and turned around and walked back up here. And I'm going to stand here and keep talking till, the, uh, till we run out of time. And that's all the product of all three of these systems working together. If I close my eyes and I keep talking about these three systems, I, I can feel myself leaning and then I come back. Why can I feel myself leaning if I'm not looking? Anyone know? You ever get a cold and your ear gets plugged up? And then you kind of stumbled around when you were walking? because it messes with your balance because you've got a little place in there where there's fluid and it sloshes around and when you start to move it tells your brain that he's tipping back bringing back forward to me this is just so cool the way God put us together and see years ago I would have said can you imagine what it would look like if somebody built a machine that could operate like we do well, guess what? You can go on the internet and watch one of those machines running through the woods, jumping over trees. Somebody has built one. And you happen to be out in the woods and he comes running by and goes, Hey, robot man! And he just keeps running and you go, Hey, robot man! And you go, well, he's a rude robot man. No, he's built to do all that stuff. He's not built to carry on a conversation with us. And if he was built, and probably someday they'll build one that can carry on a conversation with us, won't that be cool? So I say, so, uh, where's your home? Some of us are from Oklahoma, some from Texas, some from Nebraska. Where'd you come from? Hmm. He said, I don't know. I said, you came from the scrap metal yard. That's where you came from. Don't you know who built you? No. He didn't tell you that you're just a bunch of nuts and bolts put together? You are a first class nutcase. And we're all laughing. And he goes, why are they laughing? I said, 
I made a joke. You did? You understand? It's like there's no way the machine is going to get to be what we are. There's actually one somewhere in like India and they're trying to give it like rights, like human rights. Human yeah, rights. and they're working at it. And I think the closest thing we have to it here is, is Miss Alexa. You can sit in your house and tell her to play some music. Oh, no. They actually have this robot, I think her name is Sophia, but she's like pretty close to being able to like hold the conversation. There's videos on it online. And so when I meet him, I'm going to say, hey, I got this cool book. You want to read it? And then we'll talk about what it says next week. I could not read. <laughs> Someone must type the contents of the book into my system you understand yeah. it's just like there okay there's no question that we're gonna okay God God when he created us in his image and likeness there's there's no question in my mind he not only made us moral beings with a, a super capacity for communication so that we can have fellowship with him and communicate with one another but okay he's the great creator and is it obvious that he gave us some creative abilities that he gave us some capacities to be creative. So I'm not going to be surprised by the kind of stuff they build. But, okay, have you ever seen a beautiful picture somewhere and grabbed your camera and said, I'm going to take a picture of this and save it for the rest of my life. And then after you get it developed, or after you download it from your camera to the computer, you look at it and you go, it was much more brilliant than that in real life. You know what I'm talking about? It's just like something gets lost when we run it through the human creative process. God just is better at this stuff than anybody. And I don't see anything wrong with him doing that kind of thing. Except someone told Alexa not to talk to me if I talked mean to her. They programmed her to do that. I asked her to play cowboy poetry and she didn't know any and I said, well, that's, that's dumb. And as soon as I said that, I said, Alexa, do you know any, any uh, cowboy music? And she didn't respond. <laughs> she heard the words dumb coming from this voice and, and someone programmed her to say, if they call you dumb, do not respond. Well, that's dumb. Okay, so this whole list here to me is just so cool on page 61. So that's why I copied that page, what the, the limbic system does and what the cerebral cortex does and all the stuff here. That's, and, and this one, this frontal lobe stuff, uh, goal-directed behavior, concentration, emotional control and temperament, complex problem solving the day we build a machine that can build one of us that's when we've done something right okay so that's enough of that uh, yeah that internet site 44 reasons that's a good internet site to read and I don't need to go back and read Genesis 1 and 2 do I for you to know that it wasn't evolution. God created us. Page 48 to 57 talks about neurons. Oh man, I love that picture on page 60. That is so cool, a color-coded brain. And by the way, does a brain really look that color when you pull it out of the head? Have you ever seen a, a brain taken from a cadaver? Uh -huh. Well, I did when I was in college before I got saved. The guy had a brain and he took a big old bread knife. <laughs> had that thing. No, he was showing us a film where a guy took a bread knife. Cut that thing open. Turned it around like so we could see the inside of the loaf of bread to see how well it's baked cut another one open and turned it around and said, do you people see the difference? And there was an obvious difference. And he said, this brain, where it's close together and a lot of neurons are firing, 
is the brain of a non-drinker. And this brain is the brain of an alcoholic. You know what? Okay, is alcohol poison? If you drink enough of it, it'll kill you. You know what happens when people drink alcoholic beverages? They're destroying little parts of their brain. If they drink it long enough, and enough of it, it pickles their brain. I know a guy who was a mathematician, and uh, he became an alcoholic, lost his job, finally got saved, gave up alcohol. I, I saw him one time in church, and I said, so are you back teaching math? And here's what he said. He said, I can't. I said, why not? He said, my brain just doesn't work like it used to work. Do they put that on these bottles before they sell it? Caution, this will pickle your brain. This will kill brain cells, and you will be dysfunctional when you consume this beverage. Well, they put it on cigarettes, don't they? This will cause lung cancer. I have a friend who smokes, and I said, do you read what it says on the package? And here's what he said to me. Yeah, but they haven't proven it. <coughs> You're walking proof of what it does to you. Isn't that amazing? People who uh, are not accepting of the truth will just keep right on going. It's a sad thing. Those neurons. See, when you read page 48 to 57, you almost get the idea that the neurons are talking to each other. Like people. But they're not. They're, they're just chemical reactions firing. Well, there's something going on there that's so complex that we're not sure we completely understand it. Just like when they take a brain and cut it open and say, well, this is all you see, and yet the brain does all this stuff. That's the beauty of where God's creative handiwork comes to bear, and we're just never going to figure it all out. I mean, it's fun to read their explanation of how it seems to work, but this is our best explanation of what God did when he made all this. And the more you look at the intricacies of it, the more you realize God definitely did make all this. The central nervous system on page 58 to 72. What's 59 say? The brain in the middle of the page is the seat of awareness and reason. The place where learning, memory, and emotions are centered. God made us learners. He gave us the capacity to remember and he made us emotional creatures. Somebody said, well, God's not emotional. Oh, isn't he? Read through the Bible and see if you can find times when God was upset about something. Or God was happy about something. The human brain is our crowning glory, it says. What a beautiful word. The product of God's creation the product, I put in the margin here, the product of God creating us in His likeness and image. Wouldn't that have been fun if they would have put that in there instead of evolution? What do you think would have happened if this author would have put that in their book instead of evolution? Who would buy their book? Calvary University <laughs> and a couple of three other colleges. The book wouldn't be sold. It wouldn't make enough money. So they put the popular thinking in there to get people to go along with it. Oh, you want to have some fun when we talk about the peripheral nervous system on page 73 to 78? By the way, on page 71 is that picture of the spinal cord. Do we all understand how important that spinal cord is? I mean, I'm walking around here passing out papers. All it takes is one little injury someplace in my spinal cord, and I lose the capacity to walk around this room and pass out papers. It, it's like we have been wonderfully and marvelously made, but we need to take good care 
of the body that God has given us. Um, I have down here under the peripheral nervous system the anatomy of swallowing. The anatomy of swallowing. It's a cool thing. And there's another one you can Google. The effects of anxiety on the endocrine system. Who would have thought being anxious has all... I mean, I know it has mental and emotional ramifications, but it has a whole lot of biological ramifications too. And you might want to look at some of that information. It's just amazing. It's amazing out there. The somatic nervous system. Is composed of all the efferent or sensory neurons that carry information to the central nervous system and all the efferent or motor neurons that carry messages from the central nervous system to the skeletons. Do you, do you get the picture here that we've got we've got things in our body, nerves in our body, sending messages to the brain? Like for example, uh, let's just say I went home and I didn't know that. Nina had left the stove on. And so I walk over to talk to her in the kitchen and I put my hand on the stove, on the hot burner. Now, if I wasn't wired the way God wired me, I would just stand there until I noticed smoke coming off of my hand. And then I would go, oh man, I'm gonna have to go to the hospital. I've got serious burns on these fingers. And Nina says, Oh, I'm sorry, I left the stove on. But that's not the way it plays out. What happens when I put my hand down there? Right? Okay, now, did I tell my hand to pop up like that? No. The nerves in my fingers felt the heat send a message to my brain, get the hand off the stove. So my body just pops the hand up and, and then this is what, I, and then I go, and now it's registered to my consciousness and I go, ow, after the fact. If you could slow this whole process down. And then Nina goes, Oh, I'm so sorry. And I look at her. I'm sorry, ladies, but I think, you're sorry. I'm the one with a burnt hand because you left the stove on. You ought to be more than sorry. Put your hand on the stove and get a taste of what I just did. No. But I stand there and I think, that's what you get, Tom. Now, see, you would think, ladies, that's what you get for putting your hand on the stove, right? You shouldn't do that. No, this is the, this, this way this, that this book I'm reading for collateral reading talks about how, you know, that in terms of genetically, there's only that one difference in our chromosomes and stuff between male and female, but there's all these tons of differences between us. If I actually went home and did that, and my wife said she was sorry, I'm going, sorry, it's more than just being sorry, this hurts. And then here's what I would think. I wouldn't think bad about her for leaving the stove on. Anyone could do that. But here's what I'm thinking. That's what I get for buying her this new stove with this surface on it rather than an old burner because I would have never put my hand on a burner. You, you follow? I'm thinking, I shouldn't have bought her that fancy stove. Make her live with those coils so I can see. Don't put your hand on the coils. And by the way, you ever test something to see if it's hot and you touch it and it burns your finger? Does anyone know how to test to see if it's hot without getting your finger burnt? You spit on your finger. Okay, no, you, you get to go to the sink. Men spit on their fingers. That's disgusting. Women go to the sink and get some water. And when you touch it and it goes, you don't even touch it. When you get close, it goes, it sizzles the water. 
and you know it's hot so you don't go ahead and touch and somehow your body reacts to that too well actually no if you touch it and you hear it sizzle you'll take it away before your body has to because you haven't burnt it that bad it's to me it's an amazing thing to just sit and watch this kind of stuff happen to watch how this all plays out to watch the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system in action is just amazing the uh, we looked at the somatic system the autonomic nervous system now what does autonomic sound like automatic and and there's a lot of automatic stuff going on but it's not all just automatic uh, does your body have to have oxygen so if somebody in this room put a plastic bag over your head and you left it on there till class was over you would be what? Dead. Agreed? So while you're sitting here, have you have you ever has anyone sat here and said, That's I, I don't want to die from lack of oxygen, so I'm sitting here going inhale, exhale. The only time we do that is when we go see the doctor. He says, inhale. Then he says, hold it. Then he says, exhale. So basically, we have the capacity to control that part of our system that keeps us taking in oxygen. And you know what's going on, don't you? That when we inhale, we're bringing in all this stuff from the air. And then our lungs are pulling the oxygen out of it and putting, what's it putting into it? Carbon dioxide? You don't know? You haven't had a biology class yet. So the lungs are pulling the oxygen out of the air and then putting the carbon dioxide and putting it into our bloodstream and putting the carbon dioxide that's in our bloodstream that came from all these cells using the oxygen to burn to make energy and taking the carbon dioxide and putting it back in there so we can blow it out into the room. Isn't that a comforting thought? Have you ever been in a room like this that's full of people with the doors closed? You say, no, but I have been in where there was a room with the doors closed and full of people, and I open the door to walk in, and I'm going, whoa, what's that? Well, what that is is the people in the room have been using up all the oxygen and filling it up with carbon dioxide. So when you're standing in a crowd of people in a cl in closed area, this is why I don't like to ride on airplanes. No, they have a purification system. They run the air through. I don't care how good it is. The fact is that we're breathing each other's air for a long time. And that's why it's easy to get sick when you're flying somewhere because all that disgusting stuff that's going on. So you have the capacity to control your breathing, but it happens automatically. The autonomic nervous system just keeps the lungs working. And uh, if you step outside and it's raining and you run from here to the, to the next place where you're going, uh, running will burn up more energy. So what will your lungs do? They'll automatically start processing oxygen and carbon dioxide faster. Okay, now he here's, where, here's the psychology of this stuff. Have any of you ever seen a little kid get mad at his parents and hold his breath and the, and the parent goes don't do that Johnny you have to breathe or you'll die I wish I could get that mother to watch a video from psychology class that will not happen a little child cannot hold his breath and die you know what he can do he can hold his breath so long that he's so mad that he 
loses consciousness. And once he passes out and falls on the floor, what does his autonomic nervous system start doing? It breathes for him. And it's too bad we don't have an organ inside that says, dummy. <laughs> that is not the solution. But that seems to be part of what God wants us to learn to figure this stuff out and operate accordingly. And, and it does. As I go around observing people, I think, this, this, these people ought to know more than this. But I think it's amazing. You have to go to college and get a degree to do a lot of things in life. But to be a parent, you have to take a test to drive a car to get a license. But to be a parent, you just get married and have babies and it all works out. What? Just get behind the wheel of the car and I'll show you how to start it and bye, you're on your way. No. I'm thinking the church, since nobody else seems to want to do it, the church ought to have a class that as soon as somebody in church gets pregnant, they're required to enroll in the class on parenting. And what do you think is something they have to study in that class? A lot of the, 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 bio, lot, the biology of that child growing, the psychology of that child growing, the nutrition that's necessary, the sociology of that child's growing and development, and what it means to be a good parent from both God's perspective and in terms of what people write about it. But if the little kid holds his breath, just let him pass out. And fortunately, if you held your breath till you passed out, you're big enough that falling that far would probably hurt you. Little kids are this short, okay? And when they fall down, you ever watch them? They're running and they trip and fall and you think, oh no, and they just kind of roll over and get up and keep going. God's been so good to little kids to build them in such a way that they don't self-destruct before they have lived long enough to become an adult. And that's one reason I gave you that little anxiety handout, so you would uh, realize that if you look, if you Google the effects of anxiety on the endocrine system, it's an amazing thing to look at. Page 73, the somatic nervous system. Oh, I did that one. What am I doing? The autonomic nervous system has two branches. The sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Have you figured out what that would be? One has sympathy. <laughs> You're frightened and the adrenaline flows. Why would I do this? When I was a teenager, we had a big bull on our farm. And one day I decided to get over the fence and you know how bulls, when they fight each other, they paw the dirt? I just thought, I wonder what he'll do if I go <coughs> and paw the dirt. I mean, surely he's smart enough to know I'm not a bull, right? He either wasn't that smart or he didn't care. Because he came at me and I realized, uh-oh, that was a bad idea. And the adrenaline kicked in. I was afraid I was about to get gored by this big bull. And the adrenaline kicked in and I was standing by the stock tank. And all I remember is turning and one foot hit the edge of the stock tank. I jumped up on the tank and vaulted over the fence and landed on the other side. And I turned and I go, ha, ha, ha. Now, my sympathetic nervous system said, get this guy out of here. He's about to die. Then once I was over the fence, my parasympathetic nervous system said, he's safe. Cut off the adrenaline, calm him down. And all he's doing is standing there taunting the bull from the other side of the fence. You ought to know if you make him mad enough, he'll come right through the fence. Boy, you say, you weren't the smartest bulb in the package on that farm, were you? No, I just I just had all this curiosity about stuff to see what would happen. The endocrine system 
page 76 to 78. All these glands secreting stuff. And you know, when I was looking at this on the internet and how important these glands are, let's see, what is it I take? Thyroxin. My doctor said, your thyroid isn't doing all that it should be doing. So we've got some stuff you can take to help make up for it. And I'm going, but doc, if I start taking medicine to do what my thyroid should be doing, won't my thyroid just get lazy and quit doing it and I'll just need more medicine? He said, well, the fact is it's quit doing it now the way it ought to. So you need this. And I'm going, and what if I don't take it? And you can, you can go on the internet and find out if you, if you need, if your thyroid malfunctions, it'll tell you all the kind of things that can come from that and how you can deal with it. So if I want to keep going, I probably better take the thyroxine. You, you follow me? Because because things just start wearing out. And uh, that's true with all the glands that you look at them and see the things they do and what they impact and how they affect. But, but when I was looking up the endocrine system on the internet, I discovered there's another system called the exocrine system. I thought glands were glands and that they were all endocrine. No, there's the other glands, the ex exocrine glands, and that's the uh, saliva, what else was it? Sweat, saliva, mucus, it's that disgusting stuff. And it comes from glands too like your saliva glands, but the reason they're different than your thyroid gland is your thyroid gland oozes its stuff into, directly into the bloodstream, and then the bloodstream carries it wherever it needs to go. The, the uh, what, what did I say, the saliva? Uh, the saliva comes from that gland down through a little duct, a little tube. So those glands, all of those exocrine glands are attached to tubes. Now, do any of you like to salivate, just for the fun of it? You go, what? I mean, do you like to have your saliva glands just oozing stuff into your mouth? Well, if you don't, if that doesn't happen on, uh, enough to you, you get something called dry mouth, and that can be dangerous. The, the saliva coming into your mouth helps you uh, keep your teeth from developing cavities and it does some other things for you. But this is the beauty. Okay, I can make all of you salivate here if we just talk long enough about your favorite food. Fresh strawberries, fresh peaches, apricots. See, you have to swallow to get rid of the saliva because just thinking about them, your mouth says get ready because the saliva's active in digestion. And, and I think it's healthy for us to learn about this stuff, if for no other reason, just to have an appreciation for the way God made us. To me, it's just, it's just amazing. On page uh, 79, they talk about the pendulum swinging regarding intelligence from... You go through one time period and making you an intelligent person is all upbringing and then somebody else says no, the next 10 years or 15 years it's all hereditary when in fact it's what, a combination of both? And most of you know that, that it's a combination of both, it's not either or. Behavior genetics tries to find a gene for every behavior. There's a book in the library that uh, by a guy named Cosgrove, I think that's who, he, who wrote it, who talks about a behavior saying, you know, you're just a bundle of reactions to this machine. I can hook up these electric wires to your body, and if I flip this switch, I can make you pick up your hand. And if he knows how to wire it up, he could do that. He could make your hand, or he could make your finger twitch anyway. And so he said, see, I made your finger twitch. So this guy Cosgrove, he says, so are you holding the switch now? And the guy says, no. He said, watch this. I made my finger twitch. Now we both have the power to make it twitch. You just have to have a bunch of wires and all I have to do is just 
think I want my finger to twitch. He said, this big mechanism you have built, somebody else built one, and guess where that mechanism is? It's the creative hand of God making us the way he made us. It's, it's fun reading. Page 87 talks about the social implications. If you think intelligence is mostly hereditary, then what does that mean? There's no sense helping your kid work at being more intelligent. And that's just not true. There's, uh, it's important for us to say, no, it's a combination. They, they need some innate ability, but then we need to recognize how much ability God has given them and then help them develop to their full capacity with that ability. Uh, also on page 87, the mass media, I love it when the textbook says this, the mass media oversimplifies things. They oversimplify almost everything. And then they talk about social Darwinism and survival of the fittest. And we've already talked about that. So it looks like we did finish chapter two. So guess what I'm going to ask you on Wednesday when we come to class? Have you read chapter three? And if you have, I'll have a prize for you. Have a nice weekend.